Welcome. I'm Mary Davidson. It's our community and you are so welcome to join us and help me greet Professor Burdett Loomis. He is a professor of political science and past chair of the department at the University of Kansas. But I, 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 have, to, I have to be honest, your bio is just too long. We don't have time for me to tell these <laughs> good people of all the wonderful things you've done, but you're the author of many articles and books, which include national and Kansas-related topics on politics, and policy making, that's his specialty. He's a regular col columnist for the Topeka Capital Journal and I found lots of articles from the Wichita Eagle that you had written. And uh, so you can, you can follow him uh, online. Sure, easily. Yeah. He has been a guest scholar at the Brookings Institute, Fulbright Senior Specialist. And he, the most important thing, he's the go-to person in all matters concerning politics and policy making, particularly in the state of Kansas. So, welcome. Well, thank you, it's great to be here. Now, I have so much to talk to you about, I don't know how we're gonna squeeze it all in. However, have we moved past the Saturday caucus stir? Yeah, I think, uh, Kansas was a small blip on a much bigger radar screen. Uh, Bernie Sanders did very well. Were you uh, surprised? A little surprised at the margin, not that he won. And Ted Cruz did very well, getting almost uh, half the vote. And I wasn't surprised there, but again, the margin what was more than I would have expected. That's, that is truly... I. I the whole political scene is more than I have expected, <laughs> I have to true. be honest with you. Um, what really fascinates me is this anti-Trump uh, Trump movement on one side, and the and on the other side, the numbers of followers that um, he's picked up. I, that, that, what that Donald Trump has picked up? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think that this has been endlessly discussed, and it will be endless discussed for a long, long time, regardless of of what what happens. Uh, and there are as many explanations here, I think, as there are analysts out there doing it. And I think there are bits and pieces of, of what's going, going on. But I'd say, uh, as someone who's certainly not a, a Trump supporter, and I'm, as kind of aghast at the way the discourse has evolved, uh, that the, I think the, the initial thing to, to remember or think about with Donald Trump is that he is tapping into something very real. For mm -hmm. half the population, 40% of the population, uh, lower uh, working class, lower middle class people in particular, um, they've not done well economically over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, their incomes are probably down, their expenses are probably up, and the future they saw for themselves and, the, and their children uh, are really, have been diminished substantially. And so even though uh, Barack Obama's economic programs have generally produced uh, steady economic growth, there are a lot of people who have been left behind. That's true, but you know, Bernie Sanders on the other side of that coin says, we're gonna, everybody gets a free college education and everybody gets, and, and he may be not too far from right about universal Medicare. Uh, I think we're moving in that direction, but they don't. They and they're following Bernie Sanders. Well, you're too. tapping. You're tapping into much the same thing in in two different veins. I think if you look at the Trump supporters, you find them. Although there are some younger ones, his demographic skews older mm -hmm. um, and somewhat more male. Um, the the Sanders demographic clearly skews the younger kids. and. Uh, across the board, men and, and women. Uh, and, and so I think you're seeing with Sanders, people looking to the future, uh, and in a sense with, with uh, Trump, people are looking to, to a past that, uh, that seemed brighter, the future seemed brighter right, right. a while back. Yeah, no, no, I think that's true. But you know, I'm wondering, are we moving from, uh, to a, a candidate-centered uh, politic as opposed, I mean, is policy entirely out the window? I, I, I think you've got policy, party, and, and the, the candidates. We've moved to candidate-centered politics 
long ago uh, with the primary election system. If you wanted to see one change there, uh, it, it might well have been uh, John F. Kennedy, who, who uh, went through the primary process as a Catholic uh, and was elected president in, in part because he was a Democrat, but, but he had the, the charisma and he won very narrowly. But uh, I think that he would demonstrate how the candidate has become more important over, over time. We've got the party, which, we, what is a party these days? And the Democrats, I think, are conducting a relatively normal process. Uh, a somewhat more liberal candidate with a somewhat less liberal candidate. They're fighting it out. <laughs> they, they've got, you know, they've had their words, but basically they are talking about policies. You get to the Republican side, and this is a... Uh, an existential battle for the Republican Party. Well, they who, become cage fighters uh, verbally. Well, to, to be, to be, and beyond cage fighters. Uh, I mean, I don't think we've had <laughs> the, you know, cage fighters aren't talking about the size of sexual organs. No, they're uh, not. I, so was, I was flabbergasted. Every, I mean, every, I do have to tell you. Everybody was. Uh, and, and so I think that, that I, I can take about 30 minutes of a, of a, of a Republican debate, and at some point, there's, there's screaming at each other and I, can't I, ha take it. I have to turn it off. The, but um, what Trump has m made the Republicans do is sort of face what they have provided for us over the last 15 years. Lots of obstructionism. Uh, they haven't worked very uh, powerfully on, on policy and certainly have not worked with the Obama administration. Now you could blame the Obama administration to an extent as well but it's been essentially obstructionism. And, and so uh, it's no wonder that we get the distilled version in, in Donald Trump. Um, you have issues with employment and then you blame immigrants. Um, but he's saying what a lot of people are he thinking. Is no, that's exactly, uh, or, or so people say, and, and I think it's true to a, to a, a substantial extent. Um, you know, I, I think there's been an underlying racism throughout the Obama administration that's popping to the surface somewhat more. Um, and you have the Republican elites totally discombobulated uh, here. They, are. they really they don't know what to do. Uh, Donald th Trump scares them. Oh, they do scare, no, because th th he, yeah. they, they would not have, not control, but he's out of their comfort zone. The second person who is out of many people's comfort zone is Ted Cruz. Yeah. Well, they're both off the reservation. And, and if so, you, really want you know, to had know Rubio emerged yeah. as a second candidate, then all the establishment people would have gone to Rubio. But Rubio, right now, uh, he's in, in, touch, in, in in mid mid March, is really a dead man walking. He is. Uh, he so is. now you talk about oh, we'll have a contested convention. Well, I'll tell you who the winner will be in a contested convention: Ooh. Fox News, CNN. They their ratings will go off the chart. It will be 24-7 politics, uh, and certainly political junkies like me. I was going to say, we will be glued to the TV uh, <laughs> It may not yeah. be good for democracy, but, yeah, but yeah. because we don't even, we can't foresee the deals that will be making, uh, made, uh, who might emerge, and you can say, well, it'll be Paul Ryan, it'll be Mitt Romney. It will not be Mitt Romney, no. I will guarantee you. But Paul Ryan is a plausible candidate if you get to the, but think about this, and, he, and here's where Trump is such a problem for Republicans. <laughs> so it t takes 1,237 delegates. I think that's, that, that number has been emblazoned into every political pundit's mind. Um, Trump may have, as it comes up to the convention uh, in July, which is very early this year, he may have, say, 1050, 1100. So he's not there. But can you imagine how angry his followers will be if he didn't get the nomination. Oh, absolutely. They would simply say, well, this proves everything we've said. And we're not going to vote. Or Trump would take his cards and, and, you know, and, and, and create a, his own mischief to the extent that he could. Right. Uh, but they would have a very hard time voting uh, for some. So right now, uh, trying to get your ducks in order is one way or another 
It's something that all the Republicans are trying to do, but they're not being, they're not f finding a way to be united. So John Kasich is out here at a few percentage points, hoping to win Ohio, but the longer they all stay out there, the more problem it is. The more problem it is. Well, you know, um, I'm reading a kind of an interesting book, which I'm sure you've read. It's uh, Richard Washburn Child's book on the media and politics. Mm -hmm. And what he says, and it's uh, along the line of the, of the uh, personality-centered candidate, he says, and he's talking about Teddy Roosevelt, he posits that Teddy Roosevelt was the first That's right, to be a personality centered uh, candidate and he said shake hands with Teddy Roosevelt and hear him talk and then go home and wring the personality out of your clothes uh -huh, sure. and and I think um, so I, I guess maybe we further could posit that leadership has become the ability to mobilize public opinion maybe but I would say that some of these outsized personalities. Uh -huh. um, uh, for one thing, Teddy Roosevelt was not successful in the end. No, uh, no, he wasn't. Uh, and and it's unclear what uh, Roosevelt was mobilizing the progressive movement that had been around for a while, and the Taft Taft was not following through mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. um, whereas it's unclear what Trump I is 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 mob maybe he's giving uh, voice to this anti-immigrant uh, s sentiment. Uh, one of the interesting things here, and I'll get back to the, what, what, where they mobilize public opinion, but one of the most convincing things I've read is a study by various political scientists who look at support for Trump in the public and find it most closely tied to authoritarian personality traits. Yes. Which makes perfectly good sense. Um, that may get you a little away from racism or anti-immigration, but it certainly gets you uh, away from policy, too. Uh, Trump is not really winning on policy. Well, I'll build a wall. It'll be a pretty wall. No one believes that, No, really. nobody believes it, and nobody's going to pay Chris for Kobach it. Chris Kobach apparently <laughs> believes Chris it. Chris believes it. Well, but, but uh, uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll slap a 35% tariff on, on China. Well. And, and have, an ec have our economy collapse. No. Uh, so I in some sense, the, the, the outsized personality, with, with, with Roosevelt, there were policies behind it. With Trump, it's not clear wh what, wh what those are. Uh, that's good news and bad news. Uh, I think the Republican elites are more worried about, are more worried about Cruz in the sense that he has an agenda. Uh, Trump, they think, well, we might be able to deal with him. He's a transactional person. He's a business person. But nobody knows. Nobody knows. Um, I have to, I want to come to Kansas just sure. a little bit. And you, you may be alone in wanting to come to Kansas I right now. Well, I love it here, so I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Nor am I. No. But what you said, you were talking in one of the articles you wrote about Bob Docking 35 years mm -hmm. ago, when you, and he, he he came up with uh, the premise that things should be austere but adequate. Mm -hmm. And um, you felt, and I quote you here, that was scarcely heartening, you said. But uh, it was soon learned that despite the state's conservative orientation and ordinarily Republican dominance between old time populist leaning, and the populist leanings are important here, populist leanings uh, and contemporary policy commitments to education, good roads, clean environment, uh, Kansas looked like a slightly watered down version of such progressive states as Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. Have you changed your mind? No, I, 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 up through 2010, absolutely not. I think Kansas was a, a, a moderate, cons was governed in a moderate conservative way that reflected a moderate conservative population. Uh, I think that governors and state legislators, by and large, were very good stewards uh, for the state. They built a, an educa a wonderful higher education system. Uh, they built uh, a good uh, a school system. Uh, they built uh, excellent roads. Uh, all the, the, the fundamentals of, of, a, of a state that, that would be prosperous. Uh, and I think Kansas, like a, uh, 
Like they describe a fighter as punching above his weight. I think Kansas punched above its weight. It was a, uh, it was a more progressive state uh, with, with better services, better education, better roads than you might have expected. And all he had to do was drive south to Oklahoma to, exactly. to, see, oh, yeah. to see that. I think that changed in 2000 with the election of 2010, with the election of Sam Brownback, and the election of a far right uh, uh, House, uh, House of Representatives followed in 2012 by a far right Senate. Uh, and so for the last six years or so, and particularly the last four years, you've had a very different kind of policy making in, in Kansas. Uh, we all know of the, the tax cut experiment. Uh, we know of dropping revenues. But what we're seeing right now, and I mean right now in the middle of uh, 2016, is that government in Kansas cannot find a way to, to fund itself. Uh, it's looking to find every nickel, every dime. Uh, it's selling the Kansas Bioscience Authority uh, resources. Know. It's trying to collect uh, skim off, I'd say skim off, <laughs> uh, uh, traffic ticket money from, from localities. Uh, it's really staggering what's going skim on. Skim off is fighting words. I, it's skim off <laughs> is fighting words. And the other, the bigger thing yeah. and the, is that we have really, despite the Constitution's prohibition, on deficit spending. We've become a deficit spending state. Yeah. We've bonded highway money and then swept it into the general fund and now we've bonded CAPERS money and have started to sweep that into the, potentially at least, into the, into, into the general. Well that is borrowing for the next 20 years to pay for bills We're just today. changing pockets. Uh, what do they say, bar, uh, pa pa Peter to pay Paul. But, but Peter is not so much you or me uh, Peter is our sons and our, and, our, and, our, and our grandchildren. But you know, you also said something along this line that I thought was very interesting. You said the water crisis in Flint, Michigan has a lesson for Kansans to learn. Well, in, in many ways, this government in, in Topeka, the state government, uh, thoroughly dislikes the federal government, Obamacare, et cetera, the Environmental Protection Agency doesn't like local government, does not want local government to have as much control as it's had. And then it also dislikes in many ways its own state government. And so it's hollowed out much of the bureaucracy in uh, state government, whether it's uh, uh, in, in, in welfare uh, programs, whether it's in uh, Medicaid, uh, whether it's in the justice system, whether it's in the state patrol. So that lack of oversight we haven't had a, a, a crisis like Flint, Michigan, but it's re that was really a hollowing out of the governmental process. Nobody was really in charge, no one paying attention. And the least sexy thing that government does may be to assure water quality. But what's more important than doing that? Well, nothing, but the other issue is that they're throwing that the, the burden, the financial burden back on the local governments. And Absolutely. that is really a problem. And, and well, you see that time and time again. Um, and, and what happens in, and Flint simply doesn't have the resources to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So you've got federal assistance, whatever, but, but it means that Flint it, it remains in terrible financial condition. If you move to Kansas, what's happened is that more and more of the responsibility of, of funding uh, elements of ongoing government, the things, the making sure that uh, the trains run on time, um, falls to, to, to city government, to county government, to the school boards. Well, where do they get their money? To an extent, sales taxes, but basically property taxes. Property taxes. So property right. taxes in the end, Sam Brownback can say, well, I'm reducing income taxes yeah. for some people. But, uh, and, uh, and I'm, I didn't raise any property taxes, but city governments, state governments, uh, or, or city and county governments <laughs> do it, have to do that. Well, you know, it's really kind of interesting with the Governor Brownback because he does still retain his veto power. That's still right. Retain. But he seems to be losing some of the influential senators, like, um, oh, maybe King and Denning and right. some of those other. They're, they're getting a little skittish. I think that if you hang around Topeka right now at, at for any length of time, you see that one of the great schisms, not very well reported, I don't think, 
is between the legislature and the governor. If the governor has placed the legislature in um, bad positions time after time. So most recently, he embarked upon a $20 million contract to replace the, the power plant. Uh, okay. The legislature voted uh, virtually unanimously uh, to stop that. Now, he's vetoed it, but that bill, sh that, that veto should be over. I was going to say, I meant they have enough to override. Over overridden. Yeah. Uh, and so I think you're right that um, you do have some of these, per these individuals, uh, Jim Denning, Denning, for example. Uh, no question, he's a very conservative member of the, of the, the Kansas Senate. Uh, but he is someone who uh, is a serious legislator, who, who has you know, brought before us this notion of $42 million in, in bonding was, was going to be transferred yeah. to uh, with, without any discussion at all. Uh, and, and so, and, and, and King on the, uh, it's, it's interesting, Deming is, uh, Denning is, is, is kind of a, uh, he's not a charismatic guy at all, but, but, but a hard worker. Uh, I think King probably wants to be governor or senator one day. Uh, smart guy, uh, and, can, and also had a bad experience in independence where his hospital closed. Boy, and that was a blow. And so that was I, I think that, that when you see, and those are indication, and there are other senators as, and House members as well who are saying, wait a minute, we have to find yeah. a way. But as you point out, the governor still has a veto power. And on many of these issues, it won't be almost unanimous. Uh, if, if, uh, and, and so the governor's veto of, of say, say you could, uh, reinstitute taxes on the 300,000 businesses that uh, they've been taken off, uh, income taxes. Uh, the governor could easily veto that and would probably have a hard time ha having it overridden. So we're in a situation in, in which uh, the state government is unwilling to address one way to deal with budget problems, and that is um, t to go back and, and, and relook at income taxes. Well, that's right. But I would say that, you know, there are a number of seats in the Kansas legislature, both Senate and the House, that are up for election very soon. So are we in for a change? Well, that, that is, you know, as they used to say, many, 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 the $64 uh, yeah. question. <laughs> Inflation may have moved that up a little. I, I think that it's hard, you know, we will focus over the next five months six months on the presidential election, a as well we might. But Kansas just had it, it, the biggest impact on the presidential election that's going to have in the two caucuses. After that, we'll vote Republican in the, in the fall uh, by almost all accounts. But state house races and state senate races uh, across the state are extraordinarily important. And it offers the possibility to move back toward, maybe not all the way back, but back toward that moderate conservative majority that governed Kansas. And this is not a, a that majority was not a liberal majority, it, but it was a, it was a, it was a, you had good policy debates between I would say moderates, um, maybe a few liberals, and conservatives. Uh, and that there's more civility in the there was. A hundred times more civility. And there was also the possibility to have the conversation. Uh, in Topeka these days, there often isn't a conversation. Uh, and one of the great benefits of the legislature is the idea of deliberation. And deliberation simply means you talk, you and, and build arguments, and out of that deliberation, you've got side A and side B. It's not just compromise, but the deliberative process itself may make for a better product. Not a perfect product. No one's, it's a legislative process. But people say, well, why can't they just compromise? That's part of it. But the second part is to really have those conversations. Yeah. And I go back to the days of uh, uh, when I was writing a book 25 years ago, uh, Bud Burke and Mike Johnson in the Kansas uh, Senate or people like Wendell, Wendell Lady in, I remember in, them in, all very in, in well. In the House, yes. and, and many, many others, uh, Pete McGill. And they would have vigorous 
arguments. But they were all still friends. But they were still friends. And they and everyone I think would agree that with everyone else that they were working for the, the best interests of the state of Kansas. I I believe that as well. I knew them all and I believe that as well. So now I'm going to ask you, do you have uh, a prediction as to be who is the going to be the next president of our country? Well, in a sense, this is a, it's a, it's a hard question, but it's an easy question. Um, the hard part is, you know, who knows, and with the, with the, the great uncertainty of Donald Trump, that, that adds to it. But uh, there are these things called betting markets. Mm -hmm. And the betting markets right now would put Hillary Clinton against the entire field at about something over 50 percent, maybe, maybe right now even as high as 60 percent against everybody else. She'll probably win the Democratic nomination and then she would be a favorite against, certainly against Trump uh, or, or Cruz in, in, the, in the general election. So if you had to, if you were a betting person and, and someone gave you 50-50 on Hillary versus the field right now, uh, it would be a pretty good bet. Well, somebody was telling me uh, that they thought that maybe Bloomberg would, although he isn't going to run for president, would allow himself to be her vice president. You don't think so? No, I think it's possible. I do. And, and, and I think that if you look down the list of potential vice presidents for Hillary Clinton, um, the list is not very long and not all that impressive. So reaching out to someone like Bloomberg. Now the idea that this multi-billionaire would consent to be vice president is a, is a bit of a reach for me. Well, uh, but power is very um, inviting. It is, and, 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 and I think that uh, it would be, that he would, he would, speaking of deal making, he would make a deal that he would have a real role. I think so too. And as I say, thank you so much, Professor Burdett Loomis from the University of Kansas Department of Political Science and the go-to guy in politics and policy. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And I would say to you, the political junkies unite. Interesting times are ahead for all of us. Thanks for coming and I always enjoy talking to you. Bye.